We don't. Are we expecting him? Yes, I haven't heard otherwise. All right. Well, it is 601. So do we have um, public participants, Terry? Uh, there is. We have an attendee I see coming in, but I don't know if this person is going to speak on the item. But yeah, there are a couple. There are a couple of attendees. OK. Um, all right. Well, then I'm going to go ahead. But we're, we're recording now. Yes. OK. I'm going to go ahead and call to order the regular bi-monthly meeting of the Marin, Marin Water Board of Directors for August 17th, 2021. Um, the first item of business is to call the roll. Director Bragman. Director Gibson. Here. Director Schmidt. Here. And President Kohler. I'm here. Um, so we are now going, oh, I'm sorry. I need a motion to adopt the agenda. Move approval. Second. Do we have any public, I'm sorry, do we have any board comment on the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Mm -hmm. Terry, do we have any public comment on the agenda? We do not. Okay, then I'm gonna ask for roll call vote. Director Bragman. Just to adopt the agenda? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> Aye. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Schmidt. Aye. And President Kohler. Aye. All right, we are now convening to close session. So for those um, members of the public, I'm sorry, um, but we need to ask you to leave and we will be- Actually, President Kohler, we're, we're the ones who are gonna leave this time because we have a we'll second. Okay, well, Molly, maybe I'll let you explain to the public members since okay. we've got two of them here, thank you. So we, we are um, going to convene to close session, which is going to be a separate Zoom that's confidential and um, attendees can feel free to stay, but we um, plan to, um, resume the meeting, I think, around 7.30 typically. So um, you can hang out or you can return at the way. I'm going to pause the recording. All right. So we'll see okay. you all. Go ahead, please. Okay. I am reconvening um, after closed session. Um, I want to check, Terry, were there any comments on the closed session item from the public? Um, I see two raised hands. I'm not too sure if they're for the public, uh, for the closed session, but I will, um, I will um, pick, uh, select them. So the first one is Dash. Go ahead, uh, Dash, are you going to speak on the closed session item? We're here in the parking lot waiting to get in. Can we come in please? You'll, you're already in the meeting, ma'am. I think she's confused, Terry. I think you need to explain that there is no in-person meeting. Oh, yes, uh, there is no in-person meeting. Uh, right now we're all uh, conducting the meeting via Zoom. But it said that at 7.30 it would be open to the public. It means that it's uh, the public can now participate in the um, open in the meeting via Zoom. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, did you have a public comment on the um, closed session or no? I don't know anything about closed section or closed section. Closed session. I thought so, honey. It just printed out differently. Um, well, I don't know the subject, so it's very hard to question about it. Okay. All right. Um, Sydney Park. Um, Miss Miss Park, did you want to speak on the closed session item? No, I don't. I'm waiting for the public session. Okay. All right. Thank you. So there are none. Um, okay. Um, there is then. I uh, with regard to the closed session, there's no reportable action. That brings us to the um, current um, agenda, and it is now time for public comment on any item that is not on the agenda. So. Um, I see that we have a number of um, public participants, so I want to urge you, um, we welcome your comments right now on items that are not listed on the agenda. If you do have a comment on agenda items, please hold them until we get to those agenda items. Terry, do we have any public comments on unagendized items at this time? Um, yes, we do. We have four speakers. Um, so let me call on them again. Um, first speaker is Dash and then Sydney Park, please. Oops, I apologize. I lost screen here. 
There you are. Okay. Go ahead, Dash. Hello. We don't know what's on the agenda. No, the agenda is posted on our website, ma'am. Um, did you have a comment on any on the items on closed session, on the closed session items or items well, not on the agenda? I have no idea what was in the closed session and I don't know what's on the agenda. So I'm unable to ask all of your questions, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, all right. So, okay, thank you, ma'am. Okay, sure. next, next speaker, Sydney Park, please. Yes, I have a question about swimming pools. I've actually written to each of the directors and I've not received an answer yet. And I'm curious to know, since most of us are watching every drop of water, what is your plan for swimming pools? I know there are two new swimming pools in my own personal neighborhood that have been dug. And I know IVC and Marin Academy are putting in great big swimming pools. And I'm wondering how you justify filling these pools with the public. I'm going to suggest that is a great question. And I'm going to suggest that um, because we're not allowed to engage on items that are not agendized, that um, the staff um, respond to that when we get to the agenda item on the drought. I think that will be an appropriate time to address that question. OK, thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question. The next two speakers, Baron Hamill, then number uh, 1402. Ms. Hamill. in the water conservation issue back in early May, I learned that marine water is cautious about land use management by way of water and treads carefully when entering this arena. With that said, when I think about the potable and raw water that the three golf courses are using to keep their greens and tees maintained, I wonder why the board is allowing this usage when there's such a great concern about Marin's reservoirs being empty by this time next year. Perhaps it has to do with land use management. So my question is this, if the public is being mandated which days we're allowed to irrigate our gardens, isn't this also land use management, albeit on a smaller scale? And no new irrigation hookups for future landscape installations. Again, land use management based on water. So since the precedent is being set for how much water is being used for our residences, why not extend it to golf courses? A nine hole golf course of however many acres versus someone's one third acre sized garden. What's the difference? It's land use management just on a different scale. Therefore, I believe that golf course irrigation should be treated no differently in a severe drought than water for residential landscaping is being treated. As sacrifices are being made, let them be required equally across all situations. At the last board meeting, Director Bragman suggested investigating bringing water into this area by train. Given the practical <laughs> challenges and expense of this approach, I have an alternative suggestion. Mandate that no potable and raw water be allowed for golf course irrigation. You can calculate this one out easily enough, estimating that 32.5 million gallons of water are used annually by three golf courses at an average of 25,000 gallons per tanker rail car that's 1,300 tanker cars of water. Or you can simply make a trade, turn off the proverbial tap for the greens, and you have an instant savings of that much water. No trains needed, no expense involved. I know that someone's garden represents but a drop in the bucket, but think about how many buckets of water those golf courses are using every day by comparison. And let's not even go into the area of appearances. Is it too draconian a step to mandate no golf course irrigation now? When is it too soon to save 32 and a half million gallons, almost 100 acre feet of water, when residences will not be allowed to irrigate their gardens at all? And what will you do about the golf courses then? If then, why not now? How long will it take to make a difference? Collectively, we must have the determination to take action to stave off a grim future. Again, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, next, 1402, please. Uh, James Holmes, Larkspur. Likely, like uh, uh, many other uh, district customers, I was startled to read in the Independent Journal that the district had decided in an operation subcommittee to shelve the idea of desalination. 
reasonable minds can differ on desalination, and I myself am undecided. But an issue of this magnitude and importance should have been decided by the full board after a full public hearing. Desalination is not just an operational issue, it's an existential issue for the district. Certainly the subcommittees should have provided a recommendation, and that would have been the focus of, of discussion. But the ultimate decision should have been made by the full board after a full discussion and full public participation. Uh, the failure to do this raises concerns about the district's decision-making process on a critical issue. Thank you. So I'm just uh, going to interject here again. Um, I think there's a, a little misunderstanding about exactly what that process was, but again, we can't engage at this time. So I'm going to ask the general manager to address that question or that comment, I should say, when we get to the, the drought discussion, assuming that council uh, thinks that's an appropriate way to deal with it. Okay, and um, I think one more, one more speaker, Roger Roberts, I believe. Good evening. Uh, I'm happy to join you tonight. Having been up in Seattle and the Northwest, uh, I've missed some of your previous meetings. Uh, my question or comment uh, concerns uh, water rights. We recognize in a continued drought that water rights are gonna be a major issue here in California. And your plan to have a pipeline across the San Rafael Richmond Bridge is going to depend upon the water rights that you obtain. Now, I, I can't believe that you haven't done your, your due diligence with respect to the quality of the water rights that you are acquiring. But uh, the public doesn't know anything about that. And I would urge you to, in some point in time, uh, let the public know what you have done relative to water right management and, uh, and, and obtaining water rights and how good they are, what is their quality. And if they are not ironclad, what will be the role of the Water Resources Board and your role in engaging with the Water Resources Board on ensuring that the water rights you obtain will in fact be available for your use. That's my comment, thank you. Thank you, Roger. I think again, there's some confusion here. So I will again ask staff to address this when we have a conversation about drought and our plans for a potential um, bridge pipeline. Again, assuming that that works for council. I have two more speakers, uh, Maya Bartolf and Mickey Allison. Go ahead, uh, Maya. Hello? Okay, I'll just go to Mickey Allison then. Go I, ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I was a student at UC Davis uh, when the Brown, Governor Brown was getting a picture of him setting on top as, as an octopus, on the head of the octopus, with the whole bit about the uh, problems with water. We were in a water war at that time. What was interesting was Davis, UC Davis, and the surrounding community voted 80% against Brown. The following time, Ronald Reagan won that year. The following time, 80% went the other direction. What it is, is, is this water rights issue is serious. And I agree with the gentleman ahead of me. This water rights issue is serious. You need to know exactly what you've got and be assured of it because there is not gonna be enough water here. I've been there, lived through it and don't wanna see it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try one more time, Maya, and if not, we'll just go ahead and proceed. Go ahead, Ms. Maya Bartoff. Hello? I can't, I'm sorry. Uh, hopefully in a minute later on, but I think we should go ahead and proceed. Okay. Um, that brings us to de uh, directors and general managers announcements. Ben, do you have anything?
You're on mute, Ben. You're on mute. And we can't hear you. <clears throat> yeah, I'll try again. Um, I wanted to share um, an announcement uh, that Sustainable Fairfax has developed a proposal working with district staff to pursue grant funding from their COVID relief funding with the intent of, insist of assisting us with our drought response. Their proposal includes increasing drought awareness through community events, a webinar series, and deploying a team of water warriors, providing in-home site visits on how to save water, and additional incentive funding be it beyond our incentives for some of our conservation programs. And they're gonna request from 100,000 to 250,000. So, um, and this is great, and we hope it would be a model for other towns. So we certainly want to support this. So staff is going to draft up a letter of support for the President Kohler to sign. I wanted to share with the board before that was drafted and ex executed. But essentially, mm -hmm. it's just supporting this really remarkable initiative that Sustainable, sustainable Fairfax has developed to support what we're doing. Um, so if there's no comments or concerns, we'll proceed along those lines and get it to President Kohler to sign off on. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm delighted to hear it. And, and thanks to anybody from Sustainable Fairfax who's um, participating today. Um, any other board announcements? Uh, I was just gonna add, it's also the Climate Action Committee from Fairfax and Sustainable Fairfax, so. So, and, uh, you know, my only comment is, uh, I'm sure you all heard the IPCC report came out and it is very sobering. And I, I really think for not only the board and the public, <clears throat> what we're facing are huge issues. And these are beyond regional, these are planetary issues. And uh, once again, we're all in it together. So I know there's a lot of debate about how we should, what we should do and how we should do it. But we, we I think all on this board understand the challenge and are dedicated to you know, working with the community to arrive at, at the best possible uh, answers in the context of the, this challenge that is so clearly spelled out in this new report. And I would urge all the people watching or hearing this meeting to take a look at that report um, because it is, it is a very um, sobering but educational bit of reading. So thank you. Yeah, I, thanks for raising that, Larry. I think it is a very, as you put it, very sobering report and, and um, you know, very critical for all of us. Um, the one much more prosaic um, announcement I have is that Ben and I were ch chatting today about um, past we're having to decide a lot of things. Staff is looking for a little direction um, from us these meetings um, so that um, we're going to um, um, institute a policy of asking Terry um, as the board secretary to um, put together um, a summary of what the board has um, decided, particularly for items that are not action items that are directing staff or information so that we all are on the same page about what was discussed and the direction that we're going um, so that we can all take a look at that um, so that we're not just relying on our memories and the staff is not having to do that. So um, uh, anyway, so that's something Ben and I discussed. Um, if there's any board comment discussion about that, we can have that it's not an agendized item, but I wanted to take the opportunity to let people know that um, <clears throat> we're going to institute that as a as a policy going forward to make it easier for staff and everybody else to um, have clarity about what we've discussed. Um, ben, do you want to add anything to that? Your no, I think you captured it well, and I think it'll be a good enhancement to uh, what we're doing, particularly during this time. Great. Okay, that brings us to the consent calendar. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. Do we have any board comment on the consent calendar? Seeing none. Terry, do we have any public comment on the consent calendar? I have I see two raised hands. I'm not too sure if it's about the calendar though. Um, let me go ahead and call them. Roger Roberts and then Valerie Erickson. 
Mr. Roberts? My hand is lowered on my screen. Okay, all right. Um, there are no comments. Okay. I have a, could I ask a question on, on Ben on this, on the San Geronimo generator? There's a note in your report about uh, air quality standards, meeting air quality standards. And I'm just wondering if you could expand on that issue a little bit. Yeah, um, Crystal, are you up to speed on that? Yeah, let me see if I can get to the item. Here it is. Um, so we brought in temporary generators, but we are in the middle of a construction contract to purchase permanent generator um, for the plant rather than renting. And the first generator that was proposed, uh, we couldn't get the air quality standards met for the, the, the more recent Bay Area Air Quality Management District. So actor has submitted uh, uh, some specs to our consultants on a different type of generator. And, and we'll go instead of with one large generator, we're going to go with two, two smaller ones. So it'll be, um, it'll easily meet the air quality standards. We're in the middle of the construction contract now. Is this for the permanent generator? Or yeah. the temp so it, go ahead. No, it, it, it's for the permanent. And we, we've been going around a while. And finally, they have, they're proposing this as a solution. So we wanted to let the board know. So you, we would have two units, essentially. Correct. Rather than one large two megawatt, we'll have two smaller units. Okay. Would they run together or separately? Uh, and they can run together. What, is it planned to run them together? Or would we just start with one and then bring the second one on? I believe we need both to run together. Because it's kind of tricky, I think. You're going to have to have some kind of synchronization. huh? That, that's not exactly a simple task, I don't think. Right, I believe they're gonna work. make the circuitry such that they can have, you know, different- Split different it off. Things. Yeah, split it off. I got you, okay. I think that's a good okay. solution. Okay, thanks, thank you. Sure. May I call the roll? Director Bragman? Aye. Director Gibson? Aye. Director Schmidt? Aye. Director Russell? Aye. And President um, Kohler? Aye. Um, that brings us to the regular calendar. Our first item is the drought update. This is an information item. Okay, and I'm good. just gonna remind staff, I know you've got your, um, your presentation and I don't wanna interrupt it, but I do wanna be sure that in the course of the presentation, you address those two questions that we noted dealing with um, uh, desalination and with um, water rights as they relate to um, the transfers that we're discussing um, in relation to the bridge, the potential bridge pipeline. Okay, thank you. Um, Lucy Croy, water quality manager. I'm gonna bring up my screen. Okay, so tonight we have a presentation on the drought update um, on recent efforts. So tonight we'll give an update on water supply conditions and water use over the last couple of weeks. We'll also give an update on drought activities and outreach. Um, we'll give an update on a brief update on conservation um, and then move into um, a further discussion on the emergency intertie project. Um, this is a different title than we've used in previous presentations. Um, previously we've called it water transfers or the pipeline on the Richmond Vanderbilt bridge. Um, and we're making this pivot primarily to better reflect um, the objectives and, and the benefits related to this project moving ahead. So starting off with water supply and water use, um, our total reservoir storage as of the middle of August is just above 31,000 acre feet. Um, this is just about 39,000, 39% 30, of total capacity. Typically for this time of year, um, our, our, average, our average storage is around 60,000 acre feet. So shown up here, right here, we would be around 60,000. Um, and just as we've noted previously, this is really uh, a historic flow for us to be down here um, in the low 30s at this time of the year. Um, since 
uh, we've raised Kent Dam and expanded the capacity of our total system. So now looking at an update on water use over the last couple of weeks, um, shown here in the blue is um, water production. So how much our treatment plants are producing and the demand from our customers. So we've seen a, a little bit of a drop. So um, over the last two weeks, which is reflected in a 28% uh, weekly reduction in water use uh, compared to our baseline water use, our three-year average. So we're very pleased to see um, a little bit of a drop, um, probably some of the conservation outreach that we're seeing catch up with the new restrictions that went in at the beginning of January uh, of July, um, restricting irrigation to now just one day a week of, of overhead spray irrigation. Also shown here on this graph is, is another um, percentage, which is 19% conservation since May 1st. Um, we wanted to look back now since um, the drought was, was declared, the, um, the emergency declaration of water short, shortage at the end of April, beginning of May, and see how much conservation um, has been achieved during that period as compared to the baseline water use, so that three-year water use. Um, and over that period, we've seen a 19% decrease in water use as compared to that baseline. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of understand on a larger scale um, how much water has been conserved over that period. So now moving into projected reservoir storage, um, over on the black is um, the, the actual water, actual reservoir storage that we have seen since the beginning of 2020 and moving into now um, August of 2021, and then transitioning into dashed lines, which are projections. Um, the dashed lines represent um, unconstrained demand. So if we were still um, not in a drought and um, had demand around 25,000 acre feet from, from our constituents. Um, and the, the orange line being at 25% um, of average rain. And then shown here on the solid lines are both 40% um, conservation savings. And so the real takeaway from this chart is, is really that significant impact that can be achieved um, through conservation efforts um, as compared to um, going without it over the next few months. So over the, through, through the end of December, 2022, we would see around 10,000 acre feet saved. So now moving into an update on drought activities and outreach. Um, first off, our, 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 primary, um, our primary initiative is of course conservation and reaching out to our customers to make sure they understand not only about the drought, but about the current restrictions. Um, and then secondly, we've been trying to um, make sure that we access all of our, our water supply that is available to us locally. So um, since May, we have been pumping water from Sulahuli Reservoir, a reservoir that we do not typically use unless it's a severe drought. And just so since May and now through the middle of August, we've now just completed that work, that effort, um, conveying just about 1,600 acre feet over to Nicasio and bringing that into our system. Um, so wrapping that up, we'll be, we'll be returning the generator um, and have about 1,200 acre feet still in the, the reservoir. And then um, the biggest news is, is probably the opening of our residential recycled water fill station. Um, we're very pleased to announce that we are officially opening the uh, fill station tomorrow. We did a soft opening today after receiving the conditional um, oper the, the conditional letter to operate um, late last week and already had just about 14 um, customers come for the, the soft opening today. Um, that is to, to come and pick up recycled water um, from a site just next to the, to the Civic Center, um, Armory Drive, um, and put them into containers shown here. So this is the back of a Prius and um, pick up between 10 to, to 300 gallons per pickup um, and take that back to their residences to, to irrigate or wash hard surfaces. Um, so, so we're excited to see that moving ahead and, and we'll um, possibly be changing the hours depending, changing on, the hours depending on how demand, demand moves ahead. Yeah, I just, yeah, I just wanted to briefly note that um, um, 
we're really appreciative of the county who worked with us and were using their property and they were very um, supportive and collaborative getting this going. Thank you, Ben. Um, and now I'll be passing off to Emma and she'll be giving- Lucy, us. Lucy, before you leave, yeah. I'm looking at a web page right now that says that the capacity of Sulahuli is 10,572 acre feet. I was a little shocked when you said we pumped 1,600 acre feet. Uh, that seems like a pretty modest amount of water. Um, is it just the reservoir is down? And, and why would it be down? There's no real discharges from it, except for uh, the stream supplementation. We we release water throughout the year, and yes. um, going into going into the pumping operation. Um, I think we were about 40% of capacity and now we're down at about 12%. So um, with the evaporation over the summer, um, the hot summer months, that's about balancing out where we expect it to be. It seems to me that, you know, I mean, maybe that was always the plan, but that means that effectively we discharged something like 60% of the reservoir's capacity to stream supplementation just, to, just yeah sorry my my microphone's getting a little weird um sure. just about um over the last two years since the drought hit um the primary the primary discharge from that reservoir has been the stream release of course of course but it'd have to drain the reservoir down i mean i assume it was full at some point in time mm -hmm. in the not too distant future or past mm -hmm. sorry to just pass. Yeah. Okay, it just seems like we need to think about it because I've always envisioned it as sitting there more or less available. But when we only can get 1600 acre feet out of it, you know, when it has the capacity of 10,000 acre feet, that's a little bit hard to swallow from my end. I understand it is what it is. I got that. I'm just saying that it sure, I find it very disappointing that I would have expected a number like 7,000 acre feet to have been pumped over, not 1,600. Yeah. If I could, Lucy, just add yeah. to the conversation. Um, so so uh, I think it would have last spilled maybe in you know um, 2019. And of course, we received very little runoff. Uh, and, and with stream releases, I think from that reservoir approaching 5,000 acre feet per year, you can suddenly see why by the time we got to it, there was, you know, 4,000, maybe a bit less than that in the reservoir. And those are mandated releases by the state board? That's correct. Actually, and it's the only source of water? To yes. this, that's Walker Creek, is that correct? Correct, yes. It's Arroyo Sosal that, that feeds into the confluence of Salmon Creek and at that point becomes Walker Creek. Okay. Can I, uh, I, I ask a question on the recycled um, project water station? Yeah, that's what I was going to um, do too. Go. Oh, okay. Uh, no, it's and I mentioned it at the last meeting, but um, Healdsburg has a recycled water delivery service that they're doing, and I know <laughs> Lucy is rolling her eyes at me. No. But, <laughs> um, it's something I think we may need to consider. Uh, I'm not sure how we do it, whether you subcontract it or whether we have the vehicles to do it, but um, I just think it's something we need to consider if this drought, as this drought deepens, um, because we're going to have a lot of folks that are very upset that they can't either fill their pool or keep their landscaping going that we could help out with a program like that. So just, just Director something to Bregman, think about. What we have uh, as staff talked about that. And our thought is to work with those commercial haulers, get them permitted, and then on our website, identify what commercial haulers are permitted to bring you water. And we may have um, required training to do with the homeowners that sign up right. for that. So right. what, what we are now, we have this station under our belt. We are going to focus on trying to get that going. Um, first, 
step is identifying those haulers, but I don't need to uh, bring all the details to you. But, no, but we but do I understand that we do have interest in our customers and it is an opportunity for us to support that. Effort. Yeah, I'm glad you're looking into it. So good, thank you. Yeah. In our, our staff report said that uh, we're waiting upon a request uh, for for that commercial to get the commercial haulers in there. I, what are, what's who do we request of that? Who are we waiting for? I, th I think the staff report was written just right before we actually got the approval last Friday. So. Um, I think the it was really for the residential fill station, and we have all approvals at this point to move right, ahead. Right, and, and I assume there's no charge for this, right? No, no charge. Okay. Good, very good. You know, uh, Larry, you bring up an interesting point. Um, one of the alternatives that could be done, it might be a little cumbersome, but conceivably, we could deliver reclaimed water to people's stormwater catchments if they had a, an existing stormwater barrel or tank we could bring that water to them to supply whatever existing system of irrigation they have right it's an interesting idea i'm wondering ben too if we might consider having some tanks spotted around i'm sure we could talk a gasoline fuel station into letting us take a parking place with a 10,000 gallon tank and uh, offering it as a regional extension of our consumer uh, filling point. Yeah, we, we, we could look at that on your first point. I do wanna share with the board that um, we have gotten requests for customers to use our um, rain catchment rebate program for recycled water. And we are allowing that so long as they hook it up to catch rainwater, because that's the basis of the rebate, but they'd be able to use recycled water in that and have these commercial haulers fill that up. So in a way, get a twofer from a tank they may decide to install. It's interesting. Good yeah, idea. And, and I don't know, and, and maybe Paul knows, but you know, this goes to that question about swimming pools. You know, once you put that water in, it's going to go, it's going to get chlorinated. And, you know, it, I, I don't know water quality issues as, you know, like staff, but that may be a way to deal with these, you know, swimming pool projects that are sort of ongoing. The uh, regional and, board, regional board never buy it, Larry. You can't have uh, human contact with this water. Okay. Yeah, yeah never. just as an example with the residential fill station, you know, we had originally in there as a, an end use uh, car washing, you know, for, for residents to wash their cars. And uh, the regional board was uncomfortable with that. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, and I know the other thing they mentioned at Healdsburg, they, they don't want that water sitting around either. You know, right. that's, really, yeah, that's also true. You, yes. You've got to get it out. You know, you've got to use it. So yeah. Anyway. Sure. There are yeah. conditions in our permit to that. Yeah. Speak to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. Sure. Good thinking. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll hand off to Emma now. Okay. Thank you, Lucy. Good evening, everyone. Emma Detweiler, Acting Communications Manager. So we have now completed more than 50 presentations, uh, 50 stakeholder presentations. And as things have continued to open up in the county, we're actively looking for opportunities to table at outdoor events. So we'll be looking for farmers markets, festivals, and the like. We are actually tabling this evening at the Strawberry Recreation Community Night in Mill Valley. And in the coming weeks, we'll be presenting at a number of city and town councils. Thank you. Next slide. So our customer newsletter for September and October um, is in production and it will begin arriving in bills uh, September 1st. So as you can see, there's the cover there on the right. We are prominently featuring drought information, our water use restrictions, and we've included a chart for the designated watering days there at the bottom. 
Um, we're, we're continuing to feature rebates and we have provided a water supply update and information about how to report water waste. So also included in bills for the duration of September and October um, to further highlight our rebate programs available, we have this rebate focused brochure that will be inserted into bills. It um, will also be available on our website and um, here at our customer service lobby. And just taking a look at some upcoming projects, Lucy spoke a bit about the recycled water fill station. We're really excited to be opening to the public tomorrow. That will be at 10 a.m. We issued a news release this um, earlier this afternoon. So we're expecting um, some coverage this evening, tomorrow into next week as um, public participation grows there. This weekend, we are also hosting our second drought drive up event that's going to be Saturday the 21st and that's from eight to noon here at the Marin Water offices. Um, we had such a great turnout for the first drive up event that um, we are having one location this time. We are pre-assembling the water saving kits and we're looking forward to a great turnout. Can I ask Lemma, why just the location? I mean, I, I went to um, a couple of locations last time and it, it seemed to work great. Is this is it a resources issue? I just I just wonder if people are gonna as many people are gonna come by the water district as they were by the community centers where you had it last time. Yeah, so partially availability of the additional sites. Um, we also you know, had a bit of logistical trouble moving the kits between locations that were more popular or less popular, and we really did not want to run out of the water saving kits this time. So we're pre-assembling, you know, thousands of them and, and allocating all of our resources here at the offices to make sure that we don't run out and we have one available for everyone interested in coming through. Um, we also have a great uh, traffic management plan set up to quickly bring people through the parking lot and a lot of additional staff on hand. So we're just focusing resources on this one location. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, and then lastly, we are beginning to roll out phase two of our conservation advertising campaign, and we will plan to share more about that at our communications and water efficiency meeting this Friday. So that I will turn this to Carrie Pollard, our water efficiency manager. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Good evening, everyone. All right, starting with a conservation update, we wanted to roll out with the drought program participation for the for so far what we've seen for the month of August. Um, our turf program continues to have um, quite a bit of interest, um, although the square footage is fairly low. I did want to include a snapshot of the map that shows the turf applications that we're receiving. So we're at over 400 applications coming in. Um, and and uh, as Emma mentioned, we have our water conservation or water efficiency and comms meeting on Friday. And at that point, we'll, we'll talk about some additional metrics that I think will help us have a better understanding of um, while these numbers for square footage may be fairly low, um, kind of how customers are going through the process and the program so that we can, we can ensure that we're seeing um, the levels of participation that, that, that we'd like to. So, you know, kind of helping, helping us understanding what are the barriers, right? Is it, um, you know, is it the marketing? Is it, staff resources to get customers through the program, et cetera. So kind of narrowing in on that. So we can look forward to that. With all of our other programs, and we will also take a deeper dive. Maybe go back, thank you. Um, we'll also take a deeper dive on Friday to look at the various um, other incentives that we're offering. For example, our plume devices, um, rain barrels, as Ben mentioned, um, we've, we've had some um, slight movement there where folks are really interested in using those rain barrels, not only for rain catchment, but also for recycled water. And as long as they're hooking up to, um, you know, their, their rain catchment system, then it seems um, feasible and, and, you know, reasonable for them to use it for recycled water as well. So we'll talk a, a bit more detail about these on Friday. Next slide. Sorry, can, yeah, you, can, can you go back for, for just one second? Mm -hmm. So um, I think we've talked about this before and I'm sure you'll discuss it more on Friday, but these really do look like pretty low targets, especially for the gray water systems. Um, and I'm just wondering, I mean, it's great that the flume devices are flying out the door. I'm not seeing the ratio devices here. So maybe that's not doing as well, but can we, you know, what's your thinking about whether we can, um, you know, be a bit more ambitious here because these, these do look like very, very low um, targets, maybe not the square foot for the turf, but the others seem low to me. 
I mean, I think that's why we're going to have that discussion on Friday to have a better understanding of, you know, what it will take to, to hit those goals. I mean, you see for gray water incentives to date for August, we have zero. Um, so, you know, we can set the targets, but, you know, how do we drive participation, right? My goal would be to exceed all of those targets that we've established. And so, um, you know, what will that take um, before we just focus in on update, increasing the targets, you know, what, what will it actually take for us to, to get to um, even what, you know, what we have here, which um, no, I agree. I mean, it is it is a bit of you know a chicken and an egg, but um, okay. All right, contacts with customers. So we continue um, to take water waste reports and have an active water waste patrol program where have um, folks can submit online through a water waste hotline, and then also staff is doing door tags. So you can see we continue to track the emails and uh, water supports that do come in. And for the month of August, I think we're going to see ultimately exceed what we've seen even in July. So each month it continues to progress as customers become more aware of um, the prohibitions that are in place um, and also, um, you know, just more awareness around conservation programs that are available to them. At a future board meeting, we do plan on having an in-depth look at the water waste program to provide you know, a little bit more on what, what we're seeing out in the field and um, where there might be opportunities as well. Next slide, thanks. I wanna talk a little bit about boots on the ground. You know, we've, we've done a, quite a bit of sector outreach over the last few months. And um, you know, we've heard from our customers and, and, and others just that you know, maybe not everyone's hearing us. And so we sent staff out to hit the gyms and hotels. We actually went to every gym and hotel within the service area to offer program information, clean stickers or hotel um, room cards, et cetera, to make sure that the staff knew about the drought and that they could help us inform others. Um, we're continuing to proceed through the restaurant list. We have about 40% completed. We've hit almost 100 sites. Um, and, you know, in all of these situations, some folks are just aren't interested, um, but most find it very well received and we, we find that um, encouraging. And so this will continue. Next slide. Finally, I wanted to cover with some kind of other additional activities that have been launched. Uh, last week, we had a training seminar, a five-part webinar series for landscape professionals focused in on strategies for survival for landscape plant material, trees, shrubs, shrubs and turf. Each day, we had anywhere between 20 and 40 attendees. Uh, they're recorded, they're posted on our website, um, and they'll continue to be a great resource for others who weren't necessarily um, available at 6.30 a.m. to participate. Um, but we also are having a follow-up session next Monday, recognizing that there was a lot of information provided during those five um, webinar series. And we wanna be able to continue to work with our landscape contractors, answer their questions, and make sure that we bring them along as we, as we proceed through this, these drought conditions. For the AMI. Yeah. Are you doing quell trainings? I mean, this looks great, but um, I, I know the quell training is pretty extensive. Is yeah, there so yeah, so Cal, so um, California Water Efficiency Partnership handles the regional quell training, um, just because it's it it just makes it turnkey and easy for us. Recognizing that landscapers who work in Marin also work in Sonoma County and Contra Costa right. and all over the Bay Area, um, and they are starting to to ramp those back up. Recognizing you know, with COVID, they can actually do some 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 um, of the tests in person, et cetera, that and the training in person. Um, so we will see those, and they're also going to be offering them in Spanish in the coming months. So. Right. Um, that will continue. Yes. I, I don't count that as work that we're doing because you know, while we benefit from it, it doesn't require us our, our active engagement, which is wonderful. Yeah, no. I, and I do think that's great. And I, you know, I really love CalWEP. They're, they do great work, but um, it just might be useful for the board and the public to hear about that because, um, you know, in the extent to which those are landscapers who do work in the area, because one thing that I've been hearing anecdotally is that um, landscapers whom we love, we love our landscapers, um, but are not always, um, uh, helpful, <laughs> you know, because their job, of course, is to make existing landscaping look beautiful. So there's a bit, you know, I'm hearing there's a bit of a cultural resistance happening. I don't know if you're hearing the same. Yeah. You know, it's uh, always been an evolution. It's at least the last decade or so that uh, mm. there yeah. are some who are fully aware. So there's always yeah. an opportunity. Yeah. And as those training seminars come out, um, we, of course, work through comms to push them out to, um, you know, make sure everyone's aware of the, of the training happening. Okay. Moving on to AMI and the Eye on Water account. So um, with Flume having such a great uptake within the service area, we are getting a lot of interest from folks who, um, who want to install it, but may not be able to because they actually already have an AMI meter. Um, and so there's actually been a 4% increase in signups for Eye on Water accounts, which is wonderful. 
um, meaning that you know they don't need the Flume device. They don't need to spend that money. They already have the data available to them. And as a result, we're gonna send up um, sign-up instructions to all of our current AMI customers who are not already on Ion Water to let them know this opportunity, try and get them on board. Finally, closing out with the high water users outreach. Um, so we are working on the focus group. We continue to update the board on that. Um, I received the questions just earlier this week. And so we look to having that launch very soon. Um, and that data will come back to the board as a formal presentation following that focus group. Excuse me, these are backwards. We're starting with the survey. We have the questions. The focus group will happen after the survey, um, probably early next month. And so we'll report back to the board on that as well. So with that, I believe that's my last right. slide. I'll turn it when's over to the I think I missed that, Carrie. When's, when's the survey going out? Yeah, so I just have the I received the questions yesterday. Once I have them finalized, okay. they'll start and they think it'll take, you know, three or four days to get it done. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Paul Salle, Operations Director. Our newly titled um, Emergency Airtie Project Update, uh, previously known as the Water Transfer Project. Um, so, uh, again, just reminding ourselves that we, we haven't jumped straight to a, a pipeline project. We we are continuing to uh, have conservation as our top priority, as you just heard, and we're continuously striving to improve, refine, and enhance that. And some of that additional discussion will take place on Friday. Um, we are working with Sonoma Water, uh, collaborating on any and all opportunities um, through, through that resource. And of course, we've heard tonight about recycled water and not just the residential fill station, but we do have sort of the authorization for commercial hauling to private residences should folks need a, a, a larger quantity of water. Um, and so as we, as we flesh that out um, and, and figure out how to market that a little better than we have, um, we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. And of course, we've done in the past detailed work on recycled water in terms of expanding our existing system. And we know that there are a number of projects that are out there. And uh, we're, we're currently looking at, at designing the Peacock Gap pipeline. So we have that ready to go should funding become available for it. And, and we know and are aware of other projects that, that we could do similarly. Um, we, we have looked at water by, by rail, at least just an initial pass at it. Um, and I, I just had a discussion with SMART um, and, and they were quite helpful and pointed me to uh, an outfit that has a website, watertrain.com, um, as uh, corny as that may sound. Um, but they did have some information and they, they, they offered a, a very expensive, you know, it was 50 cents a gallon. And that water is coming from sort of groundwater in Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee, and would actually need to be treated once we received it here. Um, notwithstanding that, just uh, as an example, the cost per acre foot of about one hundred and sixty thousand um, dollars. I am going to continue. Can you put that into the context of what our current cost of water is to our consumers, because people may not be aware that fifty yeah, so, cents a gallon is so, really high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is really high is a, is a, a wonderful understatement. Um, I think, we, you know, our Sonoma co cost of importing water from Sonoma is about $1,600 an acre foot all in. Um, so several times greater than that. And we have all, still, aren't we still at about a penny a gallon for our yes. water on average? Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking about this issue a lot since a recent conversation with Jared Huffman. Um, you know, people should think about trucking and railing as we do about gasoline. Um, your quantities of use of gasoline or fuel are in numbers which can be trucked into a community. Of course, the cost, as Cynthia just indicated, is a penny a gallon or two cents or whatever it is versus five dollars a gallon. And that, that's the difference in what it costs to bring it in in a vehicle as opposed to bringing it in a pipeline. And the quantities of water usage, just think of your own personal usage, that we use gasoline in numbers like gallons per month. We use water in numbers of hundreds of gallons a day. And, and that's the way you can just think about that as being practical or impractical. And, and trucking is just impractical. It's not a logical uh, 
outgrowth here. It's just way too expensive. The cost of fuel for the vehicle, the cost of the vehicle, and the cost of the driver just make it out of reach. Yeah, it, it's it's a good point. Um, but as I was saying, we are going to take just keep an eye on this because it, it should be possible to find some sort of bulk rate, right, freight rate uh, by train for water to kind of refine that cost. I'm not suggesting that it's going to be our go-to, but I, I do think it's something that we should know about and, and be able to respond to. Paul. Uh, it, you know, my thought would be if, if we're going to be building a $100 million pipeline to at least look into whether there is a rail route from East Bay Mud to Marin, not from Kentucky, you can rent a um, 25,000 gallon uh, tank car for about 1200 a month. So, and that's what I'm trying to work with SMART on. Um, you know, any offloading facilities would need to be somewhere on a smart track and there are sightings just outside of Nevada that might work or there are other possibilities for off hours, you know, offloading and that sort of a thing. Yeah, um, and I, I'm just proposing it as an interim measure. Yeah. Like a permanent measure. Yeah. If only we could find a source much closer than Kentucky or Ohio to get that water. I don't think the source is the issue. Um, uh, you go back to the same issue of the volume versus the cost of transportation. As I indicated the last time we talked about this, I don't think you could get the rail car clean enough to haul water. Larry, it's not you, practical. You, you, you get a liner in the tank. You get, it's all, you know, there's regulations. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I'll, I'll, I can talk to Paul about it and you offline. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so we'll keep moving. Um, I know I know we've all heard a lot of colorful uh, descriptions of, um, of how we should be excavating reservoirs. So I did want to put some context to that tonight. You know, we're talking conservation on the order of 10,000 acre feet, water on the order of 10,000 acre feet. And, and to put that in cubic yards, that, that's, you know, 16.1 million cubic yards. I don't know what that means or looks like, but Hoover Dam is only 4.3 million cubic yards of concrete. So it's just the scale of excavating a resin. And you can down, right? You can say, oh, 1,000 acre feet more in Nicasio Fall, right? And, and we're, we're still talking vast, vast quantities. Um, I, I don't want to dwell on this, but you know, in terms of truck trips for this kind of a volume, it, it, you're looking, even at 1,000 truck trips a day, you're, you're looking at 2.2 2 years uh, in terms of excavation. So it's, it's just not, not practical. Um, from from a logistics perspective, what's the impact of our uh, state ordered uh, Lagunitas fish release? Um, uh, you know, how does that impact uh, excavating the reservoir? Or, you know, I, I mean, are, are we free to use all the water we'd gain, or do we release it for fish? Um, well, that, that's an excellent question, and we get into to water rights. We certainly have limits on the amount that we can divert to storage, um, and, and you know that's the size of the reservoirs that we currently have. So if we enlarge those, we, we would be into some sort of a permit process. But I, um, you know, even just trying to remove any, any small amounts of infill would be very challenging uh, from a water quality perspective while you were trying to use a reservoir as well. Right, and I think the same issue would apply if we tried to raise the dams. Similar, yes, mm -hmm. very much so, good point. Um, groundwater storage and, and recovery, um, th this is really a longer term opportunity and you know, the, the, the groundwater basin in, in Sonoma and, and Santa Rosa Plain is what we're talking about here. This is being studied by the Sonoma County Water Agency and the partners um, of which we are one. And it's really not a near-term solution for this drought, but it's certainly something we're keeping an eye on for the future. Um, I believe we had a question just earlier this evening regarding desal, so this seems like an opportune time to talk about that. And, and Ben, jump in if you want to add to this. Um, but there has been no decision made, as you correctly pointed out, by the board regarding desalination. It's simply um, that what staff has found it indicates that the capacity for desalination was limited and that the timing of our need dictates that, that desalination would be a temporary facility for somewhere in the region of $40 million. Um, and uh, 
should we, you know, at that point, we turn to uh, focus on water transfers or the emergency intertie project? And, you know, should, should the board decide at some point, um, we could certainly pivot back to desalination. Uh, so I, I just want to pause there and just emphasize that there is a lot of misinformation out there. So I appreciate that the question was raised and I appreciate your clarifying it, Paul, but it is really important to emphasize that um, just because something is discussed, discussed as an operations committee meeting doesn't mean a final decision has been made. I think that's what you're getting at and that um, while the staff is recommending this approach and I believe the board, um, there's board consensus um, agreeing with them, it doesn't mean that it's an option permanently off the table. Is that, have I characterized that correctly, Paul? I think that's perfect, yes. Thanks. Yeah, the, the problem was instigated by the fact that the IJ had a headline that said D cells off the table. Right. Um, and a number of people have called me on that. <clears throat> and my comment, which I think I'm accurate, uh, is that it's definitely not off the table. It may have slid priority wise uh, to some other alternatives, uh, but it's like a number of other things under consideration. And it, it, it's always been in, in our urban water management plan. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we have thought about and examined and keep coming back to. And um, I, I think it's important to emphasize that that no permanent no final decision has been made. Yeah. If I could just add one more piece, I think the um, distinction between the temporary desal in context of the drought is lower priority based on our assessment to date, but that's very different than the long-term consideration of desal um, that the board will continue to think about as we look at long-term water supply issues, which is distinct from the what we've brought to the board that was really targeted for this drought at this time where it didn't look as attractive as the emergency um, tie-in project. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and so we, we were focusing on, on water transfers and, and Roger Roberts had a question regarding water rights associated with that. And I, I guess I would just respond by saying there is a lot of work going on um, to secure water uh, via transfers um, and there'll be more detailed update uh, at the ops uh, meet, committee meeting um, uh, on August 30th regarding those um, those water transfers. But I, I think what's important here, Paul, is that there's again some confusion. It's not my understanding that the district is going out to acquire new water rights, right? We are not doing that. Yeah. A water transfer is a, it's a basically a lease. So in a sense, it's a, I don't want to get into legal, legalities here, but we are not acquiring water rights. And while I agree with the comment that was made, you know, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, I've spent a lot of my career working on water rights and there's a lot of legalities and challenges and, you know, work that needs to be done if you're securing water rights. That's not what we're talking about at all. We're talking about essentially leasing water, temporary transfers from people who themselves have rights to water, either through contracts or state board or rights from the state board. Have I put that correctly, Paul? Yes, that's accurate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, we're pursuing the feasibility of the emergency intertie project. Um, next slide. Uh, in terms of an overall project update and the, and the elements, right, we just spoke about the water transfers. We're, we're currently developing those key terms for, for the option and the supply agreements. Um, at the same time, in parallel, we're drafting wheeling agreements with key terms for our Bay Area agency partners. Um, in terms of the the, the nuts and bolts of the project itself. We're in weekly and, and multiple uh, meetings per week with, with Caltrans and the engineering team, you know, project management, engineering, CEQA, et cetera, as you can imagine. Some of those engineering issues include hydraulic analysis, the pipe routing. Um, you can imagine the, the geometric um, and structural analysis that's occurring for the bridge and the different types of bridge segments that are there. Uh, as we work through those challenging um, engineering issues. And we're also beginning to think about how this pipeline, it, should it go forward, would be operated, uh, which would be you know, some of the key elements that, that fit into the, op to the, the wheeling agreements with our Bay Area partners. 
Uh, next slide. So this is our, our, our unchanged uh, sort of uh, project schedule, uh, very much um, subject to change. Uh, it is, continues to be an aggressive schedule. We are making good progress on the water transfers uh, and looking at the feasibility in CEQA uh, uh, for mid-September sometime. Um, and this schedule, next slide, is driven by the, uh, right, the, the all too familiar by now, drought project planning reservoir level projection, which is based on our runoff uh, that we received in 2020, 2021, um, and indicates that, that we're looking at needing a supplemental supply sometime in July uh, of next year, second half of next year. <clears throat> um, this, uh, the next slide. Um, so if, if that, that was a, the, the runoff from 2021, uh, 2020 and 2021 was, was quite low on the order of 5,000 acre feet or so, which puts it on this chart here down in the, in the far right hand corner and, and maybe the, the second bubble up. So, you know, it, it, it's occurred only maybe two or three times out of the entire data set that we have. Um, <clears throat> so the red line is at about 32,000 acre feet. And it's an attempt to, to indicate, well, if you thought that the pro drought project planning slide was maybe too conservative, what would something that's slightly less conservative look like? And the 32,000 acre feet is, is an amount of runoff that if we receive that, our reservoirs would stay at about the same level they are today. So in 12 months time, if we received the 32,000 acre feet of runoff, we basically would be at the same 31,000 acre feet or, or thinking of it another way, we're just essentially maintaining a storage level uh, that, that's really an emergency condition for us. Um, so it's, it's not a high bar. It's not intended to be a suggestion that that's where we want to be. It's just showing that, you know, if you thought that the drought project planning slide was too conservative, what would some lesser uh, conservative number look like? And at, the tw at this 32,000 acre foot of runoff, we can see just from a straight frequency, no, no fancy math or anything, that, that occurs about 22% of the time, you get 32,000 acre feet or less. Um, so uh, next slide. If we think about, uh, thinking about this another way, <clears throat> last week we talked about the sort of straight frequencies which we've just looked at in that, that historical runoff chart. If we, if we think about, uh, and, and we know that the, the rainfall in one year can influence the rainfall in the following year. And we can look at how that happens in, in terms of a pattern throughout our own data set. If we classify our water year types as wet, normal, dry, and critically dry in the, the buckets, if you like, of rainfall that you see here, with critically dry less than 32 inches and dry at 32 to 45 and so on. And then you see a corresponding runoff amount in the far right-hand column in 1,000 acre feet. Uh, if we do that, then we can start to think about how often does a critically dry year uh, uh, bring us a wet year in the following year. Uh, so we refer to that as a conditional probability. And once we do that, then we can, we can generate these uh, reservoir storage levels uh, based on what we refer to as conditional probability. And as you can see here, it's indicating, <clears throat> and again, these are not intended to be uh, arithmetically, you know, super accurate numbers that you can take to the bank. This is just another way of thinking about reservoir storage levels. So uh, nobody can run off to Vegas and, and, and put money down on these odds. This is just a way for us to think about it. It is showing though that, you know, both dry and critically dry have about a 30% chance of occurrence uh, based on our data set. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, next slide. And so other than water supply, th there are some scheduled factors that we can consider um, and think about, and not the least of which is sort of the multiple agency coordination for this project, which really does increase the complexity. Um, and to some extent, it reduces our control over that schedule. Uh, thinking about just some of the agencies 
right? Caltrans, City of Richmond, City of San Rafael, Transportation Authority of Contra Costa, Transportation Authority of Marin, um, Bay Area Transportation Authority, BCDC, PG&E, you've got Chevron, and I'm sure I'm missing a few. Um, and these are uh, not uh, agencies that, that are to be taken lightly. <clears throat> of course, the, the project also has technically challenging elements. Uh, we have to cross, you know, uh, a, a refinery and, and working on refinery property is a sort of requires federal clearances, which can take a, a couple of weeks uh, just to get cleared to go on the property. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, dealing with a legacy bridge uh, with not much excess structural capacity <clears throat> adds to the challenge. And we know uh, just from our own experience more recently with uh, chemical supply that materials lead time can become an issue. And we've got seven or eight miles of pipe that at some point would need to be ordered as well as um, uh, pumps. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, the construction itself, uh, a complex project, it wouldn't be unreasonable uh, to think that there may be some unforeseen issues that might pop up to affect the schedule. <clears throat> so these other factors, along with water supply, on, on the next slide, Lizzie, uh, <clears throat> are kind of driving uh, key milestones that we see coming up. And I mentioned at the last meeting, uh, August 30th, we'd be bringing some contracts for our consulting team uh, to bring them through uh, to complete feasibility and design to support CEQA. And these are very much ballpark estimates at the moment. And we're anticipating that to be in the order of $3 million. And then in September, uh, thinking about authorizing the full design for the project. Um, and by sort of middle of October, uh, just because of lead time issues, and what we're learning about how um, the steel mills operate, uh, we, we might be thinking about purchasing materials in, in the middle of October. <clears throat> and throughout September through November, we anticipate a number of different agreements uh, coming to the board uh, regarding transfers and wheeling. And, and then should we be deciding to move forward, right? Awarding construction in February of next year. So, uh, we've mentioned the cost of the project before. Again, this is very much ballpark. Again, 60 to $90 million for the project. In, in terms of an annual cost to service that, um, somewhere in the 2 to $5 million range, depending on the, on the, you know, the cost of the project. Um, and then, of course, in addition to operations, operational costs when we're actually uh, receiving water. Um, uh, rate impacts are estimated to be between 3 to 4.5% as a one-time rate increase. And of course we haven't discussed, but we are actively looking at, at grants and low interest loans um, to support the project. We know that there's you know, $500 million that's gonna be made available very quickly for emergency drought projects with 100 billion to urban community uh, drought relief, 200 million for uh, multi-benefit and 200 million for small community. And we've been in touch with the grant administrators and, and they do think that, that this project and DSAL, should the board decide, uh, would qualify for those types of loans. Uh, next slide. So just summarizing our, our presentation tonight, uh, we'll be moving forward next steps with, you know, continuing our conservation efforts to deepen uh, that resource and, and save even more water. Um, as you saw, the timeline is tight and, and everything we can do uh, will, will help us not only in the short term, but in the long term as well, which we, we don't talk enough about. <clears throat> we will continue to optimize operations and water supply projects. And of course, we'll be continuing to monitor all our efforts and, and bring the board that information as we move along <clears throat> and monitor our performance towards our conservation goals. And of course, we'll be continuing to pursue water transfer options and the emergency intertie project planning will continue as well. And that concludes our presentation this evening. Thanks, Paul. And thanks, um, Carrie, Lucy, and everybody else who, um, and Emma, who um, presented as usual. Um, this is just a, a tremendous amount of really well, um, well presented information. And, and I'm sure I speak for everybody when I say we're grateful. I wanna start with board comments and then we'll go to public comments. Any board comments on the presentation? Job well done. 
Okay. Uh, sorry. As far as far as the materials, um, wouldn't that be subject to lowest bidder procedures? Um, I think we would um, make some attempt at, at advertising, depending on, on on how long that would take. But but I'd sort of defer to Molly, depending on how the board uh, elected to proceed. Uh, aren't we required to do that? Well, um, that. go ahead, Molly. Yeah, there are there are some um, emergency exceptions that could apply, including um, some amount of coverage under the governor's proclamation. So we're certainly going to be looking at all of that to um, potentially expedite, but certainly there could be a process of looking at who the suppliers could be. Um, I don't know, and I would defer back to Paul about um, just the, the total number of potential vendors. So it's, uh, but you know, we're looking at both of those issues. Yeah, given that it's a Caltrans project, there, there is sort of a requirement for Buy American, which is, you know, not a problem, but it does limit your sources. Um, We've been in contact with Northwest Pipe and asking them details about uh, what their supply arrangements look like. Okay, but I think I would just add it, this is this is a very um, detailed and really um, important presentation that really shines a light on the dire situ situation that we're in in terms of our water supply and our projections about what we might face in the near future if we have similar a similarly dry year. And what can we do to be prepared? Um, I, you know, when I look at the project um, to transfer water, that construction timeline and the complexities associated with it concern me as um, as something that can could run into a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, you know, just so many different factors um, come into play, and and it concerns me that we. Really, I know we are doing a lot on conservation, but I think conservation is the is probably one of the biggest things that we can ratchet up in the near term to give ourselves more time, whether it's more time to make decisions about whether to make expensive commitments to acquire materials um, or whether that's more time to deal with unexpected um, you know hurdles that, that we come across with construction of the project. Um, I just think we've got a really um, tight time schedule here, and I would look to um, to staff and to the board for us to think how can we give ourselves more time um, through conservation while pursuing these other options. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's I think that's right, and I think it goes to the points that were made earlier about. Um, you know, really figuring out how to increase those resources, how to um, become more ambitious in those targets, and, you know, really make the investments for the long term that we need to. I mean, I think we're, at least I'm hearing a fair amount of board consensus that, you know, we really are moving beyond just, um, I mean, public education is enormously important. It's a key part of this, but we're not just asking people to, you know, take short term measures, you know, like turning off the water to brush your teeth anymore. We're really talking about long-term investments in gray water, in cisterns, in turf change outs. Um, there's a raft of um, options. Um, there's been some, uh, well, let me just say, there's a, there's a universe of options. Conservation is not just one thing and investing in long-term demand reduction, especially in this district where we're still at 124 gallons of water per person per day, according to the last urban water management plan. We have, I mean, Monty's point I think is exactly correct. Um, investing seriously and across the board in um, you know, longer term demand reduction is where we need to be because otherwise we're looking for water um, you know, transfers from the Central Valley basically to water medians and lawns. And I'm, I, I'm not confident that that is justifiable financially. Um, so I think these things need to be happening on parallel tracks, but we really do need the time and the, uh, you know, and the flexibility that um, building resilient long-term solutions in um, water use efficiency and reuse are going to give us. Any further board comment before we turn to public comment? Okay, Terry, do we have public comment on this item? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have several. First, Roger Roberts, then Barbara Bogart, please. Mr. Roberts. 
I don't know what's going on with the computer. My computer shows my hand is down. Why it's showing otherwise on your side, I have no idea. I have no comment. Thank you, sir. Ms. Bogart? Yes, I do have a comment. Um, I think I'm a fairly typical MMWD customer. I've been conserving water, you know, in small ways, like having a bucket in my shower for many years. And I went into much higher gear last spring when the reality of the drought became clear. So my water use was not high. Um, there are two people in my household. There are times we went into tier two, but not far into tier two and not always. Um, but it was honestly very difficult to tell how effective our conservation efforts were when we only got feedback once every two months. And then we got a flume. And it's an amazingly, astonishingly helpful tool if you want to ratchet up water conservation. Getting real-time feedback on my water use is the most effective tool I can imagine for water conservation. When I actually get to see how much water it costs every time I flush a toilet or wash the Thanks. dishes or take a shower, I'm completely focused on using as little water as possible. It almost becomes a game when you have one of these where you see how little water can we use today. Um, we've had a flume for close to three weeks now. I still check it several times a day. Since we've had it, we've decreased our water use by 33% from our most recent bill, which already represented a recent reduction in consumption. I think you need to promote the hell out of these devices. In fact, I think you should give them away for free. If I read your slide correctly, your target was 450 per month. I think your target should be at least 10 times that high. If conservation is your top priority, and we see the difference that conservation can make in the amount of water that will be available by December, I'm absolutely convinced that the flume is the most effective tool you can give your customers to help them conserve. I recommend you do everything possible to get one to every customer who can use it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so great, much for the Great comment. job. I absolutely could not agree more. Thank you for that. And, and great job on your water conservation. Keep up the good work. We love flume. <laughs> <laughs> the next uh, couple of speakers, 1402, then Delhi Woodring, please. 1402. Uh, James Holmes, Larkspur. Um, I did not hear in the drought update and didn't see elsewhere on the agenda. Correct me if I missed it. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, any reference to making a decision upon whether to take advantage of what I understand to be the possibility of additional flexibility with regard to the release of waters from reservoirs uh, into the stream for fish maintenance uh, that is now provided to us, at least potentially, by the uh, uh, declaration of emergency that was issued a, a few months ago by the state. Uh, as I recall, at the, when I made this same comment at the last meeting, and uh, the general manager suggested that this issue might be brought before the board at this meeting, uh, I have not seen it. Uh, and I would like to know what the current status of that proposal is. There was some reference in connection with Sulahuli, but uh, it was uh, left unclear to me as to whether or not a decision could be made on keeping more water in the reservoir. So I would certainly like to know uh, when that option is going to be included in the district's menu of options with regard to retaining water supply. Sorry, Ben, are you in a position to respond to that? I, I was distracted reading an upcoming item. Um, uh, the question I, is about. I can respond to that. Oh, uh, even better. Great. Okay. Um, the question for 
uh, but the general manager was regarding the, the status of the temporary urgency change petition process. And, and there is a, a great deal of work going on. I think staff is just about um, to the point where um, they're pulling information together from the study, um, pulling information together from all of the resource agencies that, that um, several meetings have been ongoing. And I believe that there will be something brought to the board at the ops committee meeting on August 30th, if I'm not mistaken. Right, and actually bringing a um, authorization to submit the petition is what we're gonna be bringing on the 30th. And we expect um, by maybe mid-October timeframe to hear um, if, if it's accepted. And that would um, roughly save about 2,000 acre feet of water were it to move forward in somewhat the, the fashion that we'll be bringing it to the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Woodring, and then after Ms. Deli Woodring would be the phone number 8800. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Deli Woodring. I live, we live on the Tiburon Peninsula, and I don't believe that I heard in your drought report an answer to the question about swimming pools. And um, today's ARC newspaper has come out, this comes out weekly. And one of the headlines in the inner part is public can comment on plans to add pool to Paradise K home. I mean, what is that all about? I don't, I don't know what's going on with swimming pools. Thank you. Um, um, anybody on the, I, I don't want to toss this to Ben if you're the wrong person, but who can discuss that? Is that Carrie? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can start. Right now, our, on swimming pools, we require covers that greatly reduce the evaporation and water loss. And we do have an incentive program to support folks um, getting those. But what about filling the pools? I mean, that takes a lot of water. Are people getting permits to build new swimming pools like a previous caller mentioned? And this pool mentioned in the uh, ARC newspaper is a new pool that is being debated whether the neighbors should put it in or not. Yes, that, that seems like <clears throat> um, a land use planning going on with the city and the neighbors, you know, maybe as part of a larger remodel. Um, we did look at um, prohibition of filling, of topping the pools that lose some water for evaporation and understood that would um, damage the pool, the equipment, and potentially have mosquito breeding grounds in pools that weren't able to function with their filters. So that's when um, we recommended to our board to institute the requirement to cover pools. And that's what we have in place. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And I won't belabor the fact, but when a new pool is built, it takes an awful lot of water to fill it. So why are we giving permits for new swimming pools to be built? I cannot understand that in the situation that we are. So I won't talk any longer, but thank you for listening. I appreciate the comment. And I think what Ben's trying to say is that we are very sympathetic with your point. We don't have that jurisdiction. We're not a land use planning agency. It's frustrating that um, all of these um, decisions are spread out, but um, we don't have authority as a water district over, you know, when and where people build pools for single family homes. We could prohibit filling with potable water and have pool uh, projects filled with water that's trucked in from other sources. That's what they're doing in Healdsburg. So, you know, we, we, there are some options out there that are practical. Okay, we have um, 8,800, then after that speaker, Maya Bartolf, please. So go ahead, 8,800. Oh, hi, can, you can hear me, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Nancy Okada, I'm, um, uh, thank you for your presentation. That was very um, 
informative. But uh, I would like to to uh, mention this thing I mentioned the last time, which is transparency regarding the new hookups that the district is doing. And I think the general manager should actually provide the public with the past new hookups in the last six months, as well as um, at each meeting, uh, talk uh, present a report on how many new hookups have been done and how many new hookups are in the pipeline. Because we're all being asked to conserve, and yet the board still refuses to put a moratorium on new hookups. Um, now, also, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit before we go to this pipeline project. And, and the gal mentioned the pool. There's you could take the recycled water and you could take it to the golf courses. And then you would have that uh, water that's being drawn out of our current supplies. You could use the recycled water. And there are many other uh, projects that probably are very low-hanging fruit that could be done in terms of the pipeline. But my question about the pipeline is that I've been told that the pipeline is going to be used to supply water to some projects in Richmond in the development of Point Milwaukee. And I don't know the details because it was just kind of mentioned in passing, but I'm wondering if you're not using this pipeline project as a way to uh, do something in the future that maybe is going to be supplying water to Richmond and Costa Costa County. So I'd like to know a little bit more about that. So thank you very much. I think it would really behoove you to tell the public exactly how many new hookups you are doing regularly and um, what that is doing in terms of our water supply. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And do you or Paul want to address this issue about um, the bridge? I think this is the first time hearing of this myself, but uh, so I'm not. It... Yeah, I would just say that the, so go ahead, Ben. I didn't mean to cut you off. I was, I was going to say that the, the two things on, on the new services, I think they're in the general manager's report. You can find some information on new services for the current month, just past for July, and how it compared to the prior year. Um, and then re regarding supplying uh, Richmond and Contra Costa with water, uh, they're currently served by East Bay Mud, which is one of the largest water purveyors in Northern California. Um, I, I don't. I don't believe that they're short of water uh, in in any way, shape, or form. Um, so they're, they're, it would be sort of a Coles to Newcastle thing if you're English. Um, it, it it wouldn't make much sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We have a total of five speakers, including Maya Bartosz. After Maya, we have Valerie Erickson, then Margaret Fisher. Go ahead, Maya. I hope you can hear us this time. Yes. Thanks. Um, so my wife and I live near the uh, Talus Reserve Project, and uh, they've been using uh, the recycled water and uh, filling it at the Marinwood School and trucking it uh, to their site. And uh, that, besides creating a lot of traffic, um, we were understanding that there is originally supposed to have a, a T in the uh, line and, and have their own line on the site. Now that schools are starting, uh, it's going to become a a potential safety issue. So I would like to see if you could give us an update on that. And then the second question is around the use of recycled water. I understand that those customers are going to get recycled water connections for That's their right. homes. Yeah, are there other just, people that could uh, have a, what are, we doing? Uh, are there other individuals who are going to be able to sign up to have their existing houses hooked up to recycled water? Thank you. Um, ben, can you field that one or those two questions, I should say? Uh, I could answer the Talus question. So uh, we're still in the middle of um, drafting and finalizing the pipeline extension agreement that would um, have them have recycled water pipeline to each of those houses. Um, in terms of them using recycled water for their construction that's ongoing, that would be a question, uh, I think, for Paul or Lucy in terms of which hydrant is most appropriate for them to use rather than the one near the, the school if they could use a hydrant that's in another location. Yeah, I think that's right, Crystal. Um, we would direct them to another uh, hydrant if, uh, if, if traffic was going to become an issue. And I think that would sort of uh, be almost a natural outcome. So, you know, they, they don't like being stuck in traffic. 
any, any more than we do. Um, okay, Valerie Erickson, please. Hi, it's so interesting to listen to you and thank you. And number one, I love iron water. I, I monitor it three times a day. I fight with myself. I get down to like 15 gallons a day almost. So I take a bath in my hot tub and everything. I refilled my pool, but it was last year and we thought of trucking in water. If it were this year, I wouldn't fill it. I'd cover it up, number one. But number two, um, you say that desalinization isn't off the table. What's going on? I found uh, three engineering companies in the Bay Area and even one that has new technologies and it's cheaper. And I'm just wondering with the pipeline and borrowing water, I think that's more palliative than curative. And I'm just wondering how we can move forward on looking into that. I don't, I don't know what's going on. Thank you. Okay. Um, do you want to, Paul, do you want to speak to the, uh, the numbers that we've seen on, on desal? Because my understanding is that it's still fairly out of reach from a financial, not out of it, but it would still be very expensive compared to the other options we're considering. Yes, and, and to make this distinction, I think that Ben tried to earlier, the, the difference between sort of what we're trying to do is respond in the time frame of the drought and our, our projections, which really dictate that desalination is gonna be temporary, um, in, you know, in terms of a facility and, and you know, the, the, you're subject to the availability of capacity for those units on, on the market. In other words, we don't have time for them to manufacture them. We've got to go out and find them already built and, and bring them in. And what we found in re reviewing the market was that the capacity was very limited. And, and that's why we've not eliminated it by any stretch, but we've sort of uh, put it further down on our priority list while we explore the water transfers project. As I say, that feasibility will, will come to fruition sort of mid-September timeframe, distinct from permanent desalination facilities that we've looked at over the years uh, and would take two, three years to build at sort of lightning speed. Um, and for, for 10 million gallons or so, you might be looking at $200 million uh, capital project. And, and it's not a project that you can just turn off when you don't need it. Uh, desalination plants, you know, like all mechanical things, you kind of have to use them. Uh, you wouldn't want to park your car in the garage for 10 years and then come back to it and hope it starts sort of thing. So um, I hope hopefully that gives an idea of, of, of desalination. Thank you. Uh, Margaret Fisher, then Frank Agar, please. Hi, this is Margaret Fisher from Mill Valley. Thank you for that detailed presentation. Um, in my mind, there's there's long term uh, strategies and this emergency strategy, and I understand that MMWD had a had a strategy of in our reservoirs of two years, two years um, of of in case we were stuck in this situation, and we're entering we're in the second year, so um, I'm hopeful. I, North Marin water is um, they're gonna raise Stafford by three feet to expand capacity. And my, my point here is speaking up is that I'm concerned that the desalinization is not being looked at. Um, I understand what you're saying. It, it's gonna take too long for this two year drought emergency we're in, but I encourage the board to seriously look at long-term desalinization plans and also expanding our reservoir system. I, I heard what you said about it not being feasible, but if they can raise Stafford Lake three feet, um, I would just encourage you to, to look at where we can build storage from our rainfall because we do get rain. Um, and I thank you for all the work you're doing on this. Thank you. Mr. Aker. Thank you very much. Frank Eager Fairfax. Uh, I've just come down from uh, from Sonoma County, um, traveled uh, about nine miles of the Austin Creek, and it's basically dry. Austin Creek is a major Salmonid tributary to the Russian River. Marin is not alone. 
in dealing with what's happening. With the, with the winter slash spring flows of 2022, a complete unknown, the question is, what is the most prudent action Marin Water can take now? I recommend three options right now. Number one, a temporary hookup uh, for new development. I know the staff has said 14,000 new units in Marin over the next eight years uh, will only increase water uses 1% but we, we need a temporary moratorium now and no hookups. Number two, having every household slash meter holder advise the district of the number of people living in their unit or units. Since Marin Water does not require a meter uh, for, for accessory dwelling units up to 1200 square feet, Fairfax, ha Fairfax has a project right now they're processing that's gonna pro propose 10 new swimming pools. I mean, there's just so much going on out there and, and Marin Water has to be part of this, part of the solution. Uh, the, the state of California says 55 gallons per person per day is what is needed for basic health and safety needs. Now is the time to set maximum usage on a per person, per person basis. On the intertie, we wonder what is driving the cooperation of the East Bay Municipal Utilities District offering to wheeling uh, Marin, Marin new water. The Richmond City Council has approved a massive development at Point Malate, 1,452 new residences, 624,572 square feet of new and rehabilitated mixed use development. East Bay Mud does not have a transmission line to get their water to Point Malate. What's East Bay Mud wants Marin water ratepayers to fund the new transmission line so they can, so they can serve Point Malati off of an extension of it. Lastly, I cannot understand why, why MMWD cannot divulge how many new, new water hookups they have approved recently and or the number of applications to supply water to for, for coming development. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have provided that information, Frank. Um, I don't know, Ben, or if you, Paul, want to, I mean, specifically your last comment about um, new hookups. We've had a couple of presentations about this. I don't think there's any secrets. Ben, Paul, do, can you respond? I, I think you're right, President Kohler. At the last uh, meeting, I believe we went through some, some detail uh, when we discussed um, um, new connections. Um, uh, I think it was Mike. Bond that presented the information on new connections and, and provided all of that information. And I'd be happy to uh, forward that um, that board item to, to Frank Edgar. That would be great. Thanks. And uh, if you would like, I can address any capacity issues regarding the pipeline to the bridge. Sure. Hydraulically, there simply wouldn't be any capacity available for um, you know any offshoots of, of the pipeline that um, were the board to decide to go forward with the project. That there just simply wouldn't be any hydraulic capacity. I think the other thing, Paul, we need to indicate is that East Bay Mud has surplus capacity in the Chevron area because the fact that the Chevron plant receives reclaimed water from the San Pablo wastewater treatment plant. So it's hard to, for me to imagine there isn't sufficient capacity to shift water to Point Bellotti, regardless of how large the yeah. A development would be because Richmond got off of like 30 or 40 million gallons a day that they used to use of East Bay Mud's water. Yeah, there's a 36 inch pipeline um, in, in that area. So it, it, that's which is pretty sizable. Six inch, it's unused basically, or marginal use because Chevron's not taking water anymore. Yeah, it, it basically feeds Point Richmond area. Okay, we have a total of four speakers now. We have Baron Hamill and then uh, Mickey or Mikey Allison after Ms. Hamill. Go ahead, Ms. Hamill. Thank you. Just a very brief comment to uh, Director Schmidt's observation about needing to communicate. My a drop in the bucket newsletter audience has participated in a water conservation challenge sending me the information off their most recent uh, 
Marin Water Bill. I've had a 30% response to people who've been following this drop in the bucket newsletter for the last several months. And I've broken it into two categories. The average household, we've gotten 38% average savings. For what the category that I call my super savers, people who are using less than 25 gallons, less than 50 gallons a day on average before, they're now saving 42% of their average water usage compared to their previous bill uh, from previous year. So it is doable. It takes communication. And when you get to the item uh, agenda item relating to your marketing director, I have another comment to make about how to do that more effectively. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you. Uh, Mikey or Mickey Ellis, Allison, please. It's Nikki Allison. Um, I just would like, I'm a member of the House Smoke Community Floor in Sausalito and Gate 6 Road. And um, I thank you for uh, getting us the individual's residence, the information that we needed because we hadn't gotten it. And I asked for that before and you came through and I appreciate it. Problem is that I think a lot of people aren't looking at it. Uh, one of the things I looked for finally was to find that dial that shows the uh, acre foot. And it turns out that each of our houseboats, at least in Waldo Point Harbor, has that dial. And uh, so therefore, I did a little test from Sunday um, after I watered my little outdoor plants till tonight. And I did take two sponge baths um, during that time. Um, and I actually only used um, 10.2 acre feet. I mean, uh, pardon me, gallons, which is kind of small. But this means that I am pouring every bit of water into buckets, you know, you name it, and I use that to flush. But I have the experience because I spent time up in Quebec on an island that had no electricity that I had to actually turn a generator on to get water to. And we could only do it once a day. So. You know, I learned the hard way to do it. This is not the norm. So I guess what I'm asking for, is it possible for somebody who does not pay directly for their get, um, water, but through the harbor, to get one of those flumes so that I could actually see what I'm getting? Because I don't know if that's a possibility. And um, that way, maybe I can try and train my community to do something and get it to going. And I would like to be able to help and do that because there's like over 400 boats in the houseboat community. That's a, that's a great suggestion. Carrie, can you speak to that? Yeah, I can. Um, so on Flume's website, they actually list the meters that are um, compatible with their device. Um, they have really great customer service. I think that if you, uh, if you send them a picture, they'll be able to assist you because it doesn't sound like you have one of our meters. You have a, a sub meters is, is what I, what I understood. If, if Ms. Allison is still um, listening, feel, you should feel free to reach out to me directly. I actually know the folks who run Flume. They are um, based in California and I can put you in touch with them directly if you can't find what you need on their website. Thank you. Okay, um, where am I at here? Okay, we have the last three, I believe Marla Miles, then James Krajewski, and then Rick Kopis. So Marla, please. Hi there. Um, as we know that next year's rain um, prediction is gonna be another La Nina year, and sometimes those go for like five year cycles. Personally, I think we need to put moratoriums on filling new swimming pools. I mean, they could be built, but they shouldn't be filled. And also new housing, you know, they're like being built right now, but it's like, I don't think they should be getting the water. I think this is, we're in a real crisis. And I, I feel like the sooner, the better we do more stringent methods. Cause a lot of people aren't even really conserving. I see it in my own neighborhood and it just makes me mad, you know, but I think we need really, you guys really need to take real drastic measures because people won't do it. A lot of people don't pay attention. And um, I really don't think we're gonna get a lot of rain this coming year, and it might not be even the following year. So I think you guys 
take the bull by the horns and just make do it. I mean, it's really important, I think. Anyway, rant over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Kajeski. Hi, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, make yet another plea for more uh, open data and, and more accessibility of the data. I think uh, one of the earlier speakers, uh, Mr. Egger was talking about information and then it was suggested after he spoke that that information was available somewhere. Uh, but that's the problem. There is information available somewhere. I recently contacted MMW <laughs> WD uh, and uh, got some feedback in some places where some information is located, but it's scattered all over the place and there's no uh, format for going in and finding stuff that's put out in a format like a water budget of who's using our water and where's it coming from and so forth. So I would make yet another plea for that. Um, and uh, the other thing is I got my water bill, looked at that and my water use was way down compared to the area average. But again, it's a data issue. What is the area average? I don't know what the area average is. Is it houses like mine? Is it what? Those things need to be spelled out for the consumers such as myself out here, so that we know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. And our last speaker is uh, Mr. Rick Echo Peace. I apologize. Hello, uh, Rick Adler from Larkspur. And I wanted to request that you um, put on the website the slideshows that you present at these board meetings because they're very informative and very helpful to understand what's going on. And when I see them at the board meetings, um, I just barely get into understanding them and they're gone. So I, that would be my request. I would also suggest that we rethink the general paradigm that we practice conservation until the rains come again, because uh, we're in a new era. This isn't the second year or the 20th year of a drought. This is the 30th year of the new climate change paradigm. And it's just gonna get drier and drier. There'll be a couple of wet years, but it's just gonna get drier and drier, hotter and hotter, more and more fires. So we need a permanent source of new water. And the only available source would be the uh, desalinization. But I would suggest instead of the reverse osmosis, expensive, complicated, type that we build a permanent solar energy, solar electricity powered distillation desalinization, which is basically no moving parts. And you just uh, evaporate the water from the salt. The salt at the end of the day, if you've taken all the water out, that's actually a marketable product. So you don't have to worry about um, disposing of salty water. And these, um, by powering it with solar panels, they pay for themselves within a few years these days. They're so efficient and so inexpensive. And also the interest rates are at record lows. So this is the time to build a permanent desalinization plant, distilling the water using solar electricity. In 20 years, you'll find that this is, there'll be, these plants will be all up and down the coast from San Diego to Washington state. And um, now is the time to do it because if you wait until there's no more water in the reservoirs, nothing left to conserve, then it will be too late to build a permanent facility and we'll have to go the very expensive temporary reverse osmosis just to get enough water to drink. Um, I have uh, other stuff, but my time is limited. I just wanted to mention 
capturing the fog that rolls in over um, Sausalito and Mill Valley with another source of water. Thank you, sir. Um, we do have one more last speaker, Sunni Epstein or Sunny Epstein, and that's it uh, that I see. Go ahead. Hi, uh, yes, it's Sunny, and I just have a couple of comments. One is um, since every bit of water, every drop of water counts, I feel that there could be more education and more uh, marketing and promotion of practical tips for each and every household. I understand concentrating on landscaping, which is high use, is critical. However, we've got thousands of people living in apartments that um, landscaping doesn't apply and saving water in buckets. They don't have many places to put that water that they've saved in the buckets. But if there's more education about turning off the water when you're washing your hands, when you're brushing your teeth, et cetera, et cetera, I don't think that's been promoted enough. Um, another area that I think is um, an opportunity, the restaurants that I've been going to for the past several months, each and every one of them has served water without um, requesting it. And I know back in the days when we've had water rationing, that was one of the third, first things that happened was um, restaurants would only serve water on request. So you're not only saving the water that people don't drink, and then there's fewer glasses to wash. So I don't know where the district, what kind of say the district has over how restaurants operate, but um, I believe it would just small, every small change of habit will help in our conservation because obviously we're not getting there fast enough if we're still at 28% after all of these months when we need to be at at least 40. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank I'd you. I'd appreciate your presentation. Are we there, Terry? Um, that is it. Okay. Um, that brings us to item six. I, I, I'm sorry. I want to thank the staff again. I really want to thank everybody who participated. Your comments are helpful. I'm hoping we asked, answered at least most of your questions. Um, item six is approving um, an amendment to a contract about um, adding conservation core um, uh, resources for conservation core folks. Um, I'll just say I am going to sign off. It's 12:30 where I am, and I'm falling to pieces, so I'm not going to be that helpful in um, running this meeting further. So I'm going to say good night to everybody. For the record, I am voting yay on all of the items left to approve. I've read the full <laughs> packet and I support everything. So um, with that, I think I turn this over to Larry Russell, right? You're the VP of these days. That's uh, correct. Great. Okay, night, thank you. Again. Good night. Okay, Conservation North Bay Turf Removal and Training Program. I have that item, uh, Director Russell. So the Conservation Corps North Bay uh, contract, this is an amendment to add 70, 000, just over $70,000 to the contract to allow for the uh, drought response contract that was initiated um, to do direct installation of sheet mulching for our customers. Uh, it would allow us to continue this project. So we have a over 100 applications that have come in. Uh, the initial contract for 99,000 offered 29 days of installations, um, and then a couple, four days of in total of training for these these crews. We have a total of 15,000 square feet already replaced as part of those 29 days. We have another 15,000 kind of teed up, um, but based on the level of interest, um, we're proposing to add um, an additional 27 days. Uh, and have the contract go through October 14th. Uh, the rebate program will continue to be in place um, for anyone who uh, may choose to not participate in this direct install program or during the time um, after October 14th when the program would, um, would end and be, we, would, we would end it for the winter essentially and then propose to bring it back uh, in the spring for the board's consideration to expand. So if this is an action item, happy to take any other questions. Um, that you may have. Why, why would we stop it in the winter? Yeah, CCNB, uh, they, they have limited oh, crews during stop. the winter. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. And at some point in the future, Carrie, I would appreciate it if you could give us an idea of the makeup of the folks that are in this uh, workforce. Just, you know, a rough 
stuff. Sure. You know. I'll do that on Friday. Sure. That'd be great. Thank you. Any comments, guys? Great idea. Okay. Can I get a motion to approve? Move approval. Second. Roll call, please. Right. There are public comment. Sorry. Public comment, yeah. Oh, public comment, sure. Uh, there are no comments on this item. So, roll call, uh, please. Director Bragman. Aye. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Schmidt. Aye. And Vice President Russell. Okay, thank you very much. Um, number seven, high efficiency toilet rebate program. I also have this item, uh, Director Russell. So this is a proposal to <clears throat> reinstate the high efficiency toilet rebate. Um, we did terminate this program or suspend this program um, about a year and a half ago and the staff proposal is to reinstate it. This would offer an incentive for um, toilets that are labeled MAP premium. And what pr MAP premium means is that they're um, they ensure high performance and they also exceed the, um, the state regulatory flush volume standards that are in place. So it does ensure additional water savings beyond what the, the, the current regulations um, require. This rebate is proposed at $150 per fixture. And we're also proposing that the toilets that are replaced or that are eligible for replacement um, are three and a half gallon per flush toilet. So these are um, very old toilets. Um, and we want to, to, of course, encourage the change out of those toilets. Uh, these, the flush volume that these MAP premium come in at are 1.1. So there's a fairly significant uh, water savings opportunity to, to be had there um, in changing out these fixtures. Again, once again, this is an approval item. Happy to take any additional questions. Uh, I don't disagree with the logic, except why not open it up beyond the three gallons. I mean, why not go after the 1.5s? 1.5 to 1.1 is like a 25% difference. I mean, I understand that, uh, you know, three to one is a uh, two thirds reduction. I got it. But the other doesn't seem insignificant to me either. Yeah, so just when we do the analysis, I mean, it's of course at the board's discretion, but when we do the analysis for the half a gallon of savings we would achieve and the $150 investment per fixture, um, you know, it, it does make sense to focus on three and a half, but it, it, it of course it's at the board's discretion to um, to make those changes. You know, um, you kind of stole my thunder there, but it, it's it's not thunder. It's just you know you've got multiple flushes per day, so <clears throat> even half a gallon per flush is going to add up, and it's for the lifetime of the fixture, so. Um, you know, I would encourage us to open it up to, you know, any fixture 1.5 and above um, and see how it goes. I think we want to encourage folks to go for it. And, you know, it's not a big program, but once they're in, they're in. And we'll keep saving money every time there's a flush. And with our demographic in Marin, there's probably above average number of flushes per day. So I, I think it would actually pencil out at the end of the day. So uh, I would I would second uh, that amendment. And, and, you know, going into that a little more in the thinking part, it's similar to the Peacock Gap. It's a gift that keeps on giving. You know, it's a one-time investment and, and, and carries right on the mechanics, I'm sure, of the, the more value of the threes. But Larry Bragman is right on the assessment. You know, like you said, it's it's like a twenty five percent drop, mm -hmm. and it it's forever. You yeah. know, just keeps giving. So, anyway, any other thoughts on it, guys? Sounds good to me. Um, okay. okay, can I get a motion? Didn't you make it? Can I make it? I thought. Oh, you I didn't Larry second it. Okay, that sounds reasonable to me. Uh, do you have the direction sufficient, Carrie? I do. Thank you. Okay. Can we get a roll call? Um, do you want to take public comment? Because there is one. Uh, sure. Okay. Valerie Erickson. Ms. Erickson. Hi. You're, you're talking about uh, approving, um, was it last week's meeting that was supposed to be on Zoom, but then it wasn't? 
And so we don't know what that is. And also, what's the Peacock Gap project? It's a reclaimed water project to bring a reclaimed water to the golf course. So you reclaim the water from what? So it's non-potable water? Sewage from Las Galinas. Yes, it's non-potable. It's been treated up to near potable levels, but it's non-potable. Perfect. And it's good fertilizer and that makes sense. Exactly. It has a little more ammonia in it. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Because I know many of my golfing friends would be really mad if I said cut off the water <laughs> for the golf courses. But if I can suffer, you know, uh, 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 you know, I'm saving water. So, well, you can encourage him to use McGinnis Park. It already has reclaimed water. True. I love that place. I love that place. So that's good. Yeah. Me telling them what to do. That's that's a joke. But anyway, so <laughs> what what does sheet meddling mean? What does sheet what? Sheet meddling? Meddling, something like that. I don't know. I heard that expression. I don't know what it means. Got me. I believe it was sheet mulching from the previous item. Oh, All right. It's a it's a practice of um um removing or doing away with turf grass that's that's current you know currently high water use plant material it's a process of covering the grass with compost cardboard and mulch um, so you don't actually have to cut the, the the grass out to um and send it to the landfill to replace it so. okay terrific okay um uh, that sounds good and I like i didn't realize that we're recycling with the sodium you can great idea you can sell the sell the sodium yep brilliant brilliant because i really think we need to investigate that because i think this is long term and I, I, you know i'm afraid civilization is going to be rubbed out we share your concerns thank you thank you okay uh there are no further speakers okay roll call director bragman uh, I to Direct the to to the amended um, motion. Thank you, Director Gibson. Aye. Director Schmidt. Aye. And Vice President Russell. Aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, approval item eight: regional collaboration between MMWD and local Aye. jurisdictions for land use planning and compliance with the state's model water efficiency landscape ordinance. <clears throat> Right, I also have this item. Um, so this uh, regional MOU was initially established to provide clear roles and responsibilities for in implementing our landscape plan review process, which is actually a state regulatory requirement for our local jurisdictions that we'd been handling on their behalf for a number of years. Um, and we were doing that without a formal written agreement. Um, and so what we did here is we negotiated a, uh, a, an MOU that kind of sets the initial framework on working closely with our local jurisdictions initially on the um, landscape plan review and their compliance with the water efficient landscape ordinance. But I think there will be an opportunity down the road to, um, to use this as a mechanism for, for further collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, but the item what we have before you, the, the, the specifics are really around landscape planning um, plan review process. To date, we have eight of the local jurisdictions, eight of the 11 local jurisdictions have already signed the MOU. Um, which is why we've now brought it uh, before the board for your consideration. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have as well on this item. Is there anybody in charge of this? Hmm. You know, is there anybody directing it or pushing it? Karen. That would be me. Oh, good, good. <laughs> well, let's push a little harder because I see like Tiburon hasn't signed. I'd be happy to give Greg a call and lean on him to sign I think it. That would be helpful. I think okay, that would be helpful. I'll take care of that. And if each of us could take our own cities, sure. you know, sure. just give them a call. Sure. Yeah, and they all, I think that we will see them um, engage with us and work with us. I think that there's just, you know, various turnover and other, other issues have come up, but I think a, a bit of a push would be, would be productive. Yeah, because sure. some of these are in March and some are in June and we're in August, you know, mm -hmm. I, so I think we should, like I say, if each of us will take our respective towns and give well, we only have call. three remaining. So it's just Larkspur, Tiburon, and the county of Marin. All the others have signed. So we're, we're, um, well, we're set with all the rest. Then, then you guys get off easy because two of them are mine. So <laughs> and I guess I might as well take the county of Marin and I'll take all three. 
and we'll we'll get this ball rolling. Very good. Any comments, guys? Harry, you've been busy. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just wanted job. to know, this is really a nice initiative that Kerry has kind of conceived and moved forward because it really starts to do what the board has talked to us about of formalizing the relationships among us in the jurisdictions and all the dealings we have. And I agree with Carrie that we can build from this MOU other coordination activities to really get clarity on roles and responsibilities and the like. So I think this is a real advancement for us. Yeah, I think, cool. I think it's, it's brilliant, really. I I also want to point out it started, you know, right before, right when COVID hit. And so it's just been outstanding that we've been able to actually get most of the signatures yeah. at this point. So, yeah. Yep. Herding well, cats. I, I will take it personally to get the other three. So I'm going to give them till the Friday and let's see if we can't get it done. <laughs> <laughs> so I need a motion, guys. Move approval. approval. Second. Roll call, uh, public comment. There are none. Roll Direct, call, please. Director Bragman. Aye. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Schmidt. And Director Schmidt. Aye. Oh, and Vice President Russell. Aye. Okay, number nine. Approval to fill communications and public affairs manager position. Ben, I think you're up. Just take oh. that because she was on a roll here with oh. all these. <laughs> items. So um, th th this is an item to fill um, the manager of communications position, certainly an essential position here and more so in the times we're at. Um, it's a budgeted position and we're just looking for authorization to begin recruitment to fill it. Cool. Uh, let me make a quick comment uh, in the chair position. Um, it, these current um, descriptions do not have the person who would be in charge of making the presentation. So it's a little difficult for the chair to call on someone because I don't know who to call on. So I don't know why that was deleted, but it's deleted so um just a little helpful uh, information there any comments from the board i hope you'll consider uh internal candidates yeah i second that me too absolutely okay approval second any public comment yes there's one baron hamill good miss hamill Ms. Hamill. Newly informed water conservation advocate with my eyes and ears on the ground. It's obvious to me that the communication strategy that Marine Water has been pursuing is failing in its overall objective to reduce the public's water consumption by 40% as quickly as possible. I'm aware that Marine Water is now without a communications director. While it's regrettable, it does provide an opportunity to make the most out of this change. I understand that a search is underway to fill the position and that you already have a consulting firm handling some of the communications work. However, I'd like to suggest that now is the perfect time for Marine Water to shift their approach to how it's reaching the public. Use what in the public relations world is called crisis communications, because whether acknowledged publicly or not, we're all in a deep crisis in the making. There are PR firms in the Bay Area that specialize in crisis communications for companies, both large and small. An online search will bring up many capable local firms. I strongly encourage you to reach out to a few of them to hear what they have to say about turning this ship around quickly. As I said, Marin is in a crisis and in my opinion needs to do more, a lot more, to communicate the immediate necessity for changing how the public behaves with an actionable plan. Why else do you think I've been working so hard on the sidelines to get the word out to an otherwise relatively clueless audience? Thank you again for your attention. And thank you for your comments and thank you for your hard work. We appreciate it. 
No further speakers. Okay. Roll call. Director Bragman. Aye. Director Gibson. Aye. Director Schmidt. Aye. Vice President Russell. Aye. Okay, number 11, approval to fill distribution system operator position. Oh, wait, we missed number 10. Whoops, sorry. Oh, I got a little excited there. Yes, I was trying to speed things up. No, right, 10? Oh. Yeah, 10 is mine. So this is the authorization for the general manager to hire and recruit for a construction inspector one, two. Um, as you might have heard in the past presentations, we've really, uh, the, the level of effort that's required to, to manage our paving and uh, concrete restoration work following pipe repairs has really um, increased in terms of time commitment. Uh, we, the staff over at the pipeline maintenance group currently spend over a full-time employee equivalent just managing uh, paving restoration work. And um, so the uh, intent of this is to um, convert a vacant utility worker uh, over to construction inspector one, two, and to move oversight of uh, asphalt and concrete restoration work over to engineering. And then uh, we would manage in the engineering department, the, um, the permits, the um, working with local jurisdictions on, on you know, the extent of paving, the invoicing with the uh, contractor. And then every few years, we have to put that contract back out to bid for uh, asphalt work. So um, uh, with that, uh, any questions? Perfect, thank you. Comments from the board? Move approval. Second. Public comment. There are none. Director Bragg, please. Yep. Director Bragman, sorry. Aye. Director Gibson. Aye. <clears throat> Director Schmidt. Aye. Vice President Russell. Aye. Thank you. Okay, I'll try this again. Number eleven, mm -hmm. approval to fill distribution system operator position. Deja vu all over again. Uh, Paul mm -hmm. Sully, operations director. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't want to withhold uh, hold up the well-oiled machine tonight. Um, uh, we have a retirement in the distribution operator core. Uh, Ron Spencer has been with us for 18 years of reliable service in that group uh, is retiring at the end of September. Um, this group, you know, is in court, located in Corte Madera in the operations center, which is 24 seven. And they're responsible for not just making sure our tanks and pumps are operating and, and moving the water the way we want it to be moved, but also when their pipeline breaks, they're the first resource call uh, that receives that call from whoever it may be. Uh, and so they're you know, coordinating all of those activities as well. Um, we're not increasing any FTEs in the operations group. We're just replacing like with like. And uh, our request tonight is to authorize the general manager to recruit and hire uh, one distribution system operator. Thank you. Questions from the board? No, move approval. Second. Public comment? None. Director Bragman? Aye. Director Schmidt, I'm sorry, Director Gibson? Aye. Director Schmidt? Aye. Vice President Russell? Aye. Thank you. Okay, number 12 is upcoming meetings. Um, you wanna do this, Terry? You want me to do it? Um, I can do it just quickly. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, this, this Friday we'll have our regular seat, or I'm sorry, we'll have our special communications and water efficiency committee meeting at 9.30. Uh, next Thursday, we'll have our finance and administration committee at 9.30. And then Monday, August 30th, please remember our operations committee special meeting. And then sometime tomorrow, I will be nagging the board about finalizing our operations committee meeting for October. So please be available. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much. With that, I will call oh. the well public comment i guess and, there are no public comment right. okay thank you all and see you friday, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Friday. Friday. Bye. Bye, bye. see you friday take care bye 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 everybody bye bye